Mr. Mike McMullen, looking dapper, looking professional. How are you, my friend? Doing well. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to have you. I want to begin on a very large goal. So I tell people that the quality of your life is determined by the quality and the level of the questions that you ask. And the question that you're asking right now in your life and your business is how the heck do you become the first billionaire in Alabama? So let's talk about why do you have this goal of becoming the first billionaire in Alabama and how are you tackling something like that? How do you digest a goal like that? I think with the structure of our companies and with my sister and I owning the companies together, we have a family office that we own in addition to our additional companies. And so the thing that we set out, I guess about six years ago, it's like, what's our big goal? What is that thing that everyone thinks thinks is unattainable. And so right now there's only one other person even close to being a billionaire that lives in the state of Alabama, I think is net worse in the 950 million range. So we said, wouldn't it be cool if we as a family were the first billionaire family in Alabama? We love where we live. We really don't want to live anywhere but here. And while we have homes in different parts of the country, we're seeing just tremendous growth in our economy, we're seeing tremendous growth in our team. And we have a culture within our organizations that is the growth mindset. I never have understood when people own companies or when they're in this pattern of, okay, enough's enough. I hear this from people. It's kind of, why would you ever stop growing? Why would you not continue to grow your team to help your companies continue to grow? And I think that was the catalyst for a lot of this. We're a company, Core Companies is our overall company with prominence homes, builds, starts about a thousand houses a year, new construction. We manage over 2000 single families in our rental management company, America's Rental Managers, and then Mike McMullen Associates, we sell about a half a billion a year in real estate. And that's in little old Alabama. People are scared to stretch sometimes. And putting that big goal out there, it's amazing how it is when you break it down in tiny parts all the way back down to today. And how do we achieve that? And how do we get there? And what was interesting when we were analyzing and looking at how do we get there, it's a whole lot harder to get to a hundred million than it is to get to a billion. And so that was our realization is we've done the hard stuff. The hard stuff we did through the last 20 something years. And so now it's getting to a level that is beyond comprehension is, and, and that's we, we have about a hundred employees. We have about a thousand subcontractors that work with us and, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi. And when we go in and open a new market, we have it down to a science. And so it's like you follow these, basically we're in six markets right now in order to achieve our billion dollar net worth goal for me and my sister, we know we need to be in 13 markets producing at the same level as our six now. And within three years of that, we'll hit that billion dollar net worth target. Man. Was this a vision? So the interesting thing about vision is the higher that you set the vision, the more people get on board with it. Whereas most people's default is the opposite, right? To where they think that they need to set small attainable goals so that their self-esteem and their egos don't get damaged if they don't hit those goals. Was this a goal and a vision that you crafted from the very beginning when you had nothing? Or did you maneuver to this level of vision when you had some momentum? I think that goes back to the conversation of rich and poor. When I didn't have money and didn't have these companies and the net worth, I was still rich. Money is a scorecard, basically. You measure it by the impact you have, your generosity, your family. How much time do I get to spend with my family? How much time do I get to spend pouring into my team and growing leaders? That's, I would say, if I were looking at anything that drives me and my sister the most in our companies, it's the growing leaders. And I always tell our leadership team, your success is my success, but I'm more excited about your success probably than you are. And it's just, and I think it's that whole generosity and giving. And it's like, I always tell them when you give, it comes back to you tenfold plus every time. And I think that's the thing that people miss People try to hoard things and they try and preserve and protect. Sometimes you take some risk and sometimes you invest in people. And especially when we're starting a new company or we're growing a company, sometimes you go through a little period where you're not making money, you're pumping money into it. But with the long-term goal of it 
getting to a point where it grows exponentially. And I think that's the, I think it's a, people miss that. It's all about the give back. And that's our philosophy with our companies, with our employees, with our clients, with our investors. It's just, what can we do to help someone else? And if we do that, we're in turn helping ourselves, but that can't be the main motivation. People talk about compound interest all the time when they discuss index funds, stock market, investing, real estate. But what they don't talk about is the compounding interest of goodwill. And goodwill compounds faster than any material investment that you make. I'm curious, is this, is this how you've been wired? Would you attribute this belief to your upbringing, to your raising? Is there anyone in particular that you can pinpoint? Because where you are and how you operate your business is a bit different than the status quo perception of how most other wealthy, quote unquote, individuals are running and managing their companies. I think you're doing it the right way. What made you do this th the right way from the beginning and not go into the ego part, the egocentric where you're succumbing to the bigger house, the bigger car, living in the milestones and the material? I think it goes back a long way to when I was, when my sister and I were little, our grandmother, I'm 53, my sister's 55, and our grandmother was an entrepreneur. And she owned a small little grocery store with two gas pumps, and she taught us business. She taught us how to treat customers. She taught us how to um, take care of people. And if you take care of people, the money comes. And, wow. and she just... She was ahead of her time and she, I guess she, she bought the store and I guess 1965, 66. And so by the time I was born in 69, it was up and going, she grew it. And then eventually down the road in the late eighties, she ended up selling that business and she ended up living. My grandfather lived to 88. My grandmother lived to 94 and they had enough money to live comfortably uh, for the rest of their life. Um, wow. based on that. And she just always poured into us about the importance of taking care of people. If you take care of people, then the rest follows. And I think that's the thing. She was a cool, so we, they called her the mayor of her little uh, community. It was a 300 people, 300 people live in this little community where she had her store. She was the church treasurer mm. and handled the money for the church. And she just, they called her the mayor because she just took care of people. And I think that my dad, our dad is an entrepreneur also, and on to, he's 76 now, still running his company, not because he needs the money, because he just loves it. And it's, again, he, we watched how he takes care of his clients and his customers. And just a side note about him, uh, my dad is one of those, I've seen him give the shirt off his back when he didn't have it to give, and because somebody else needed it more. And I think that's, just that philosophy is incredible. When you start looking at the legacy of what we have pumped into us over my 53 years and my sister's 55 years. That's incredible that now that level of goodwill and that training and just that extra attention when you were growing up made such a difference. And I know that's very important to you as a father. I want to get into the business. Ladies and gentlemen, we will get into the business. But the question <laughs> I'm about to ask is the question that all of you are thinking about constantly. A lot of you that are listening to this already have a good level of material wealth. You already have some commas in your net worth. Things are going fantastic. But here's a point that keeps getting brought up in our community, Go Abundance, which is how I was introduced to you. And that question is the transfer of wealth and the transfer of skills to children. So a lot of our members view this transfer as the biggest responsibility of their life, right next to that of growing the business, because it's such a responsibility and it's a weight that your children have to carry. And you have two girls, correct? I do. Yeah. So the goal of a lot of the guys in GoBundance is to prepare their kids and make sure that their shoulders are strong enough to bear the weight of wealth and business and responsibility. I'm curious how you view this and how you're going about this to continue the legacy. We've made money not the most important thing. We have a huge faith in God and we've raised our kids to have, they have a mass, like it's all faith-based. And it's one of those things where when you start looking at what's going to matter in the end, the money doesn't matter in the end. It's what you did along the way that yeah, I feel like at some point I'm going to go through the pearly gates and I've got to an answer for what I've done. And I think with my girls, 
We've done a great job and we've had our parenting fails. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but everyone with my, especially my oldest, she's at Auburn University now and she's getting a degree in law and justice. I'm a lawyer by education. So I'm excited about that because she's kind of following my footsteps and get a, planning to get a law school. But one of the things that she has a much different mindset because of how she was brought up in more of a wealthy environment, because our wealth came later once I was working, we were very comfortable, went to private school and all those kind of things. My parents provided very well, but not at the wealth level that my kids have been raised with. And so we have really focused on them on the give back. And I think part of when we were starting to look at what my daughter was going to major in and what she's going to do, she's getting a, her major's law and justice with a minor in philanthropy and nonprofit. And the reason is we see a vision. My wife and I have a vision of what our foundation is going to look like. And I want her trained to be able to handle that, not from a, just from a legal monetary standpoint, but from a humanitarian standpoint. And then our youngest, she's more bent toward, she wants to do event planning and she's more, she's the hostess with the mostest. She loves, <laughs> she loves to entertain just like her dad. And we've always joked a little bit. My, my dad, when I was at Auburn as an undergrad, he said, I majored in fraternity. You go for an education. The education is the least of what you get academically. I think it's 10% of it. It's how you inter- interact with people politically. How do you interact with people and get along and come to consensus and that kind of thing? That's why I think the Greek system is a phenomenal way to do that. My daughter's involved in that at Auburn now. And it's interesting to watch her growing in that, growing in those leadership roles, getting involved in the things that give back. With our companies, I've all, often said in the last 25 years of the growth of our companies is we partied our way to success because the way we sell things is we host events. In, for instance, I, the last two weeks I was in Portland, Seattle, San Diego, and Miami hosting events for clients. I would spoke at two conferences and did all that. And then we will leave on November 10th. I fly to Dubai to meet with a group of our clients there. And then we'll be in Israel and we'll have anywhere between 150 and 300 of our clients that are coming to a seminar. And then we're doing a big client party for them. Well, it sounds like all we're doing is partying, but not really. What we're doing is we're developing relationships because people basically move because of relationships, not because of external factors. It's about the trust and is this person watching out for my best interest and not in it for themselves. And I think while we're, obviously we want our companies to be successful and profitable, but I've always had the philosophy and my sister has too, that if we're winning and everyone around us is losing, that's a one and done. But if you can ever figure out, even if we have to take a hit on profit, if we have to take something but to make everyone win that's at the table, that's a continuing relationship that continues to grow and you develop that trust. And it was apparent through the Great Recession in 08 to 11, our companies grew like crazy. My sister and I were in phenomenal cash position. We were able to take advantage of some good buy opportunities, but we also brought our clients along that path with us. And we have maintained 90 plus percent of all those clients who still buy from us. And it's those long-term relationships. I got a birthday card yesterday. My birthday's tomorrow. And I got a birthday card from one of my clients. I texted with them after I got it, sent them a picture, told them thanks. I said, can y'all believe we've been working together 17 years? When I met with them, they were 53 and 52. They had pretty good net worth, but we sat down and created a portfolio of investment properties and they bought 18 investment properties in Alabama, paid them off over a 10 year period, bought an apartment complex along the way. And now you know what they do? They have a big motor home and they just travel all over the country and they collect their <laughs> check. And he was one of the top producing real estate agents in Los Gatos. He's just a phenomenal guy, but he was able to walk away from it because his financial picture was so secure. And so now he's mentoring other people on how to do the same thing, which I love. It's that whole perpetual thing where you do it, then someone else does it. And it's, it just exponentially grows when you teach people to do that. I love that, man. That's freaking awesome. And happy early birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you. Gonna, I get to be part of the early celebration, man. This is awesome. Yeah. Honored. But I want to take a pivot. I want to go into people more in the back half of the interview. But first, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a couple of questions about 
wealth building in general in different vehicles, because you were raised with a perspective in the very beginning that kind of accelerated and put you a bit ahead of most people. Because the most of the seasons that I see through doing over 100 hours of interviews now and walking the journey myself is you go in that corporate mindset, phase one, to where I work for somebody else, I put time in, I get money, I work harder, I make more money, there's a cap, but I'm okay with that. That's phase one. Phase two is, okay, I've learned about investments, stock market, real estate, flipping, Airbnb, stuff like that. I'm going to start investing into these investment vehicles, and they produce me what's called passive income. And I get passive income, and now I can exit the rat race. And then right. phase three is creating the businesses, and then being an income generation machine to where now you're playing the multiple game, and you're saying, okay, if I can get my revenues and my EBITDA up, then I can increase the multiple at which my company would be valued and therefore sell for. And so I'm curious between all of these stages, if you were to go back and give advice to somebody that was beginning their wealth journey, which path do you think, would you lean more in the investment side or would you jump more into the business creation side from the very beginning? Hope that made sense. Both and. Both and. Okay. Both and, uh, I have invested, I've been investing in re developments in single family residential rentals. I have an apartment complex some things like that, but I've done that for 22 years, all at the same time I was building the business. I've always mm. been a believer in you, you do it and then you sell it. Like you, I can't tell somebody to do something if I'm not doing it myself. I need to be the one doing it first so that I've worked the kinks out of it. So whoever I'm selling to basically has a smoother process. We, and that's what we've developed with our turnkey operation all the way from land development, all the way through the eventual sale and rental of the properties. And so everything's under one roof, everything's in one place. And they, we have specific people to do everything in our organization. I think the biggest problem I see is you have a mentality in the country. People don't like to be uncomfortable. Well, mm. You don't grow unless you're uncomfortable. There are times to be comfortable. And sometimes you need a breather to take your breath and assess where you are, but then you need to get uncomfortable again because you're never gonna be at the levels that you wanna be, or some people are comfortable just being comfortable. And that's okay, I'm not judging. That's just not how I'm wired. No. I'm wired to, to learn. I was just at a family office conference in Miami that I spoke at, but then I also sat in on three of the lectures and I came away from that, I love to just, walk away with knowledge, stuff that I can put into practice that I didn't know about. And it's, you have to always be learning. You have to always be a sponge for anybody around you. And it can be anywhere. I joke a little bit. I learned more from Reginald, our, the guy who cleans our building, because I come in sometimes on Saturday and Sunday morning when it's quiet and I'll get some things done before my girls and my wife are up. And I talk to him usually at least twice a month. And I, he's just, he's a hard worker, has his own little business and he's done a great job, but he just has wisdom that you can't ever discount because of someone's, because they're not at the same level as you financially, they still have wisdom that can help you grow as a better person. That's so powerful. That's the commonality that you see between people that get it and people that don't is you think you know it all then that's where you start dying. That's where the death and the decay starts. I think Aristotle was the philosopher that said, I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. I love that. To provide a bit more context to the question, we see a hangup, almost a self-imposed glass ceiling on entrepreneurs in the seven-figure mark at the seven-figure range. Maybe they're at $2 million, $6 million, and they've been investing and their investments have treated them well, but they can't quite figure out how to break through that to get to the eight figure mark and above to make that leap. And so that's been the topic of conversation and go abundance in our series seven to eight, where it's been more so getting with those entrepreneurs and being like, okay, hey, your investments are fantastic. You got a great investment philosophy, but we need to build a business and we need to build a machine behind this and do some M&A and actually build an enterprise here and get other people involved to get you up into the next levels. What advice would you give to somebody that's in that specific situation? This is what I would say. And this is something that when I'm talking with some of our younger leaders in our company, they want everything today. Everybody wants everything today. 
it takes time and you have to have systems in place that are fail safe systems all the way down to uh, my wife and I do the same exact thing we did with money, even at the financial level we're at right now. I still have 19 drafts that come out of my checking account every week that go into specific investment places, like wow. different accounts. That was a practice one of my business coaches put in place with me about 15 years ago, where if you just put stuff on automatic, you don't have to think about it. And then when you turn around, you're ready to invest in something. The funds are there to take advantage of an opportunity as opposed to having to scramble to come up with the funds to do it. Because a lot of times people may have a two, six, eight million dollar net worth, but they're tied up. They have no cash. Mm, and so, yes. And I would say that's probably the biggest problem I see with investors and growing, growing wealth is you can't do anything without cash. It, it, even if you're borrowing from the bank, they want to see that you have cash. And so my sister and I are, and maybe this goes back to my grandmother, who was an all cash kind of person. We're, we're all cash on a lot of the things we do. And we may throw leverage on it later, but a lot of times we can move on a project or move on an opportunity so much quicker than other people because we have the cash to do it. And then we can, again, put it on good financing down the road, but we can act on the opportunity get ahead of everyone else and move forward. And, I, and so I preach that to my team. I remember having a conversation. You've met Robert that works with me, one of my vice yes, presidents. Yes. He's kind of like my, uh, I have two daughters. He's kind of like, like that son. son. Ever had. And we, I remember we were on a flight coming back from California about six and a half, seven years ago. And I remember having this conversation with him. I said, how much do you have in the bank? I just like, you know, that I'm pretty blunt. I, I can talk about money with anybody. It doesn't you? Bother. <laughs> and it was funny because everybody is so busy putting money into these long-term things, but they don't keep short-term money. And I asked him, I said, how much is enough to have in short-term? He said, I don't know, three, four months of living expenses. I said, why don't you try about seven years? That's more what you need. So wow. that you don't ever have to worry about whether your lifestyle is taken care of so that you can focus on the opportunities that come in front of you so you're not scrambling whenever the opportunity comes. And But so many people make that mistake. I think it's been drilled into us by the government and by education systems and all that, that these are the models, follow this model. I, and people are like, well, you're not getting a return on your cash. I said, oh yeah, I'm getting a return on my cash. Just a perfect example of that was I haven't been in the stock market. Uh, the last time I was in the stock market before April 3rd of 2020, was March of 2007. I took every dime out when the Dow was at its high in March of 07, started investing mainly in real estate and holding cash. And what I said was, if it ever drops again, I'm going in. I put a million dollars in the market April 3rd of 2020. And September the 15th of 2020, I cashed out at 2.78 million on that million dollars. And I'm not in the stock market at all. Again, I'll wait until the people who invest in the stock market long term, I feel like are losers. They're going to lose. It does not. You've got financial advisors who are preaching something that pad their pockets, not yours. Man, you just came out. You just came out guns blazing there with a couple of contrarian takes. This guy was too buttoned up. He had to come swinging, man. I love it. Yeah. All right. So I first off, I'm my positions in stock are very low. Like it's 10% of my portfolio personally in the stock market. And that's just because I'm a real estate guy now. And I see that return. And I also see the return on reinvesting in my own business. And I right. see that the velocity of money just goes through the roof when you're investing back in yourself or to that point, investing in acquiring more income producing skill sets. I'm obsessed with investing into, let me learn this skill. Let me hire this coach. Let me join this mastermind. Right. Obsessed with that. I am, I was actually shocked at your views on cash position personally with the seven years, because normally when you see somebody that's killing it in business, leverage and debt is like their best friend in the context of low rate fixed long-term debt. They view it almost like an asset. So I'm, I'm that's, that's shocking. Leverage. I'm not anti-leverage. I'm just, I, I'm leverage at the right rate, right terms. But if you have enough cash, you can wait for the right rate and terms. You're not locked into having to do it to make the deal work. You can go ahead and spend cash and do the deal and then figure that out on the back end. That's our philosophy. We fund a ton of our, of our developments and things like that from cash. And we've been doing wow. that for 
long time. And it just, we, we have great banking relationships. I have 13 banks I've worked with all over the country, two large ones out of Manhattan that have been great to work with. But again, that all goes back to relationships. Everything's relationships. If I, if I meet with a bank and they come and see us and I'm dealing with junior, who's making 60 grand a year, looking at me and judging me, I'm done. I don't, I'm, you're out of you're my out. I'm not doing that. Uh, I don't have to do that at this point. And, and they bankers nowadays, there's probably five to 8%. They're actually probably pretty good and know what they're doing. The rest of them are useless button pushers. I completely agree with that. But for sake of time, I want to keep us going here a little bit. So I had the pleasure of gaining the friendship of Jeff Hoffman. Jeff was the founder of Priceline.com and he's founded these massive companies and he's had multiple exits and companies under his belt as he's gone throughout his career. And he says that there's this quote that millionaires and billionaires have seven streams of income, 15 streams of income. And he goes, yeah, I agree with that. But you build them one at a time. You're a serial entrepreneur, not a parallel entrepreneur. That's so right. you have three companies vertically integrated. What's your hold co a global real estate services? Is that your hold? Actually, it changed. We changed to core companies at the beginning okay. of this year. Core companies is the overall company. And we actually have four under that company. And it's we have a title company now too. Nice. Uh, so yeah, it's all under one big thing. But that's a perfect thing. I'd probably have 25 income streams, but you can't, you need to get those companies on automatic where they're working for you while you're focusing on building the next one. And that's in our philosophy is we, we have, we work it, we get it to a point where it's producing well. And a lot of them are complimentary businesses. So it helps. They feed each other. David Osborne, I'm going to send this to you and I need to introduce you to David, by the way, you okay. guys would be good buddies. He's at yeah. your level in Austin, Texas, and he's a mentor of mine. And uh, David's got this quote, I do, we do, they do. He goes, I do it. We'll bring a team in and then I outsource it. Once it's on autopilot, I move on to the next thing. It's exactly right. what you said. So it's cool to see recurring patterns and themes. I'm curious, now you have the title company, you have the Mike Mullen and Associates brokerage, you got American rental managers and prominence home builders. Which ones of these did you start first? And I'm curious about the process of which ones you established in what order and if you would establish them in the same order going back. Yeah, we, I started, I finished law school and didn't really want to practice. And I never could find a real estate person that could answer my questions. So Fair. I told my wife, even a, a turkey flies in a hurricane. So this is going to be easy. And so I went ahead and went into real estate sales. I guess it's been 20, 22 years ago. Quickly became number one for the company I was with in three years. And I was number one in the Southeast for Remax in 08. And then went out on my own in 09 with my own brokerage. And in 06, we started America's Rental Managers as a, basically as a value add service for my sales business, because again, I'm real big on service. And when I couldn't find rental management companies that would deliver the kind of service that I wanted for my sales clients. So we built a company that does that. And then also in 06, I started doing joint ventures with a builder and uh, we did projects from 06 to 10. And then my sister and I started what is now Prominence Homes in 2011 and have grown it. And then Title Four we started this year. And I really don't know that I would do it any different than I did. It basically, every business had a reason that we did it to support the other business. It's sure. kind of, it's, and every time we turn around, we're finding things that, okay, if we have a vendor, if we have a company we're dealing with, that's not providing the service that we would like, then we just start our own business that does that. And we become our own best customer. Do you do much M&A in your businesses or do you just start from the ground floor for, for every new thing that you do? I've never done an M&A deal on businesses. I am, I don't want to buy people's crap. I like knowing my business from the ground up. Because it's, it's it's a harder road on the front end, but it's a better road on the back end. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I'm mm -hmm. curious, if you were to go start like a brand new company tomorrow, say you were going to start Mike McMullen's podcast company. Right. I'm curious about now you obviously have economies of scale and it would be something that's strategically positioned within your, your niche and your skill set, and you would have resources in place. If you decided tomorrow that you're going to create this new company, I'm curious about what you would begin with. Like my thought process is that you would say, okay, this is the company that I want to start. 
let me go ahead and start headhunting and put the pieces in for who's going to be the CEO here and then start there and then go down. Is that correct? Or how would you, how do you go about it? I start with the end in mind. Okay. Uh, anytime we start a company, the one thing that I, my sister and I have done this since the beginning, what's our exit? What, wow. Okay. What's the exit? Because if you don't have your exit clearly defined, that's where it gets sketchy, especially when you have partners. You have to know and have really clear parameters on your operating agreement and the way that things are run and what's going to happen in the event that things go well or in the event that they don't go well. It needs, needs to be outlined. Okay. I want to get into another very important topic, which on that note of people, I want to get into how do you find almost your VP, like your operations guy? Because in this world of entrepreneurship, we have the visionaries and we got the operators, right? And so we have a lot of guys, with very visionary tendencies, and they can't put it down on paper. They're too far up in the clouds. So they can't get boots on the ground. And they are, they're scrambling 24 seven, trying to find who their operations guy is and attract that person. So right. I would love to hear your advice on this, especially how you got linked up with Robert. Anytime that I'm recruiting or looking for someone to bring into our organization, I want to know somebody that knows them. And there's very few people in our companies, especially in our leadership roles that I have not either known or I've known their families or I've known their friends or their acquaintances. I'm not quick to trust and my sister isn't either. And so we like to know where people come from and that they're solid in their morals, their beliefs, the and those kind of things. And Robert has earned his own, Robert Bygrave that you've spoken to that's going to be a part of Go Abundance also, is he was one of those finds that's just, just was a great find. His mother is actually, has been one of my private bankers for 15 years. So I've known him and his family since he was, I guess he's 32, since he was in his teens. And his brother, Matthew, actually also works for us too. And there's a lot of, we're not an anti-nepotism kind of company. We have a lot of family. We have a lot, we have a lot nice. of friends. And that's how we, that we recruit some of the best people just through our networks of people we know and trust. And I, obviously they're not going to get a job if they're not good, no, but it, it kind of makes things easier when you know where somebody's coming from. And like with Robert, the one thing I figured out about seven years ago when I hired him was I needed someone who was, could absorb what I do, how I do it, and basically almost be a walking, talking me. And so for years, I have taken Robert everywhere with me, everywhere I've traveled, all over the world. Every, he's been in every meeting with me, and it still is. I still take him everywhere because I couldn't relieve my day-to-day -day duties until someone else knew what I was doing. We, and then we just have long-term people who have just been successful in their careers. Our director of people that I just hired in July is one of my best friends for the last 25 years. He retired as a principal in one of the top school systems in the country. And I figure if he can deal with 2,000 students and 4,000 parents, he can do this in his sleep. And <laughs> he's our director of people. We don't like the term HR because I just think it has a negative connotation. He's, he's our people coordinator. I love it. I love it. Now, for sake of time, we had two more topics. I wanted to talk to you about your continuous investment in education, even at the level that you're at, where you just did a 10-day marriage retreat. That could be a whole separate podcast, but just for people listening, just know Mike's still invested in himself, even at this level. He's just finding other avenues to invest in. All right. So I love that, but we'll put a pin in it for a further conversation because I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, let's okay. end this last five minutes on preparation for what we're getting into right now and what we're seeing over the next 12 months about what you guys are doing. Let me ask you a question, Brian. Is the economy bad? I don't even know how to answer that because it depends on how you want to look at it because I still see opportunity everywhere. It's not that much different than it was six or eight months ago. It's just perception. You start looking at data, the data is the same. The data is not that different. You've got some artificial inflation of rates. You've got, you've got inflation at 8.2% right now for October, still average 5.4% for the year. And it's projected to be at 2.7 for 23, 24, and 25 Interest rates are at seven right now. They're projected to be at five and a half by the end of the year and five by September of next year. All I see is opportunity because when everyone else is asleep, we're buying like crazy because it's a sheep herd mentality. Everybody follows all this garbage that's on the news. I stopped watching the news 15 years ago because it's all crap. It's all being pumped out. 
to influence and push people toward what our government wants them to do, as opposed to what really makes money in this country. And that's being an entrepreneur and not running in fear all the time. And they want you to run in fear because that's the way they control what you do. I love it. I think that's the the thing. That's the perfect answer that we can give, man. That's awesome. In closing, guess, tell people where they can find you and where they can find more information about you, possibly partnering with you or doing business with you. Yeah, I'm obviously in Birmingham, Alabama, but you can reach me at Mike at MMA sales, S-E-L-L-S dot com. You can also reach my executive assistant, Charlotte at MMA sales dot com. That's usually the quickest way to get to me is through her. She handles a lot of my day to day scheduling and that kind of thing. And then uh, my number is 205-515-1026. Usually text is the best way to get me initially. And I like to schedule calls and I like to do face-to-face meetings. That's kind of how we do business. I'll just, I'll get on the plane and fly and meet you. If it's a worthwhile meeting for you and me, I'm glad to do that. This man just listed his number and his email live. (laughs) You are, you're cut from a different cloth, my friend. I love it, man. I love it. If you want to get in touch with a future billionaire of Alabama, be sure that you're coming at Mike with something worthwhile, though. Don't don't just say, Please. yeah, perfect. All right. And in closing, I forgot to ask you at the very beginning, so I wanted to save it towards the end. So right now, three years away from the billion goal. So what are we? where are we sitting today? Because I want to track this now with you, because now I'm excited for this with you. Net worth is about 100 million right now, give or take. 10 or 15 because it fluctuates. But yeah, and we're projected with just the growth of the companies. That'll jump to about 250 million by the end of next year and then 500 million at the end of 24. And then by the end of 25, we'll be at a billion. All right, people. So please take that in closing. Don't get intimidated by that. Use that as inspiration and fuel. Remember that there's levels to this and he's got the same 24 hours in his day that you do. He just is going to hopefully not be bombarded by text messages from you guys. (laughs) So Mike, man, appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Definitely wanting to do some interviews down in the future about all the rest of the stuff you're focusing on, but thank you for doing things the way that you do them. Thank you for being the role model that you are. And hopefully I'll be meeting you at one of these GoBundance events in the future, buddy. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thank you, sir. All right. See you, buddy. Bye.